years ago, there's a pathologist in Australia who put up on YouTube where he had done this, what they call hack the microscope, and come up with a way <coughs> to work on a microscope <coughs> with uh, uh, less than $100 of, of uh, hardware. Uh, a lot of brain power, you can a lot of brain power put into it, but the hardware. Uh, a device like that on the market, uh, if you get it to move into a, a hospital lab, it easily can cost $50,000 to $100,000 definitely starts at twenty to forty thousand dollars. So the bottom line is you're paying for an awful lot of brain power there. Mm -hmm. So and what we decided to do is try to see if we can get it down to the high school and the middle school level for teachers who are teaching in the, in the school and basically here. So Ron from Copper's Cove, he's an expert programmer. His wife is the uh, electrical engineer and she's the one that does the most of 3D printing, right? They're, they're whizzes on 3D printing. They have four or five 3D printers and all the expertise. Four, we have four. Four? Only four. Wow. Okay. And all the expertise that goes with it. So they have, uh, you know, I've been bringing people there on the second Wednesday of each month at Copper's Cove Library. Uh, he and his wife has a group called the Makers Group. Uh, makers of Central Texas. Central Texas. Central Texas. And we're trying to get people interested in this and not only senior citizens uh, but the young people to get to them because a lot of this stuff is not covered in schools and a lot of the children who are going to school can't necessarily uh, take it in school. So the way schools are structured, for example, uh, one of my helper that was here last week who's not here today is with her school band today. So she plays in the band so they're starting the band season for the football season. Well, if she's in the band, for example, there's certain programs she could not get in. She cannot get into the health education program uh, where she would get her uh, associate degree and her uh, high school diploma at the same time. An associate degree would be in healthcare, which I'm interested in. But because she's chosen band, uh, she can't be in that. So the bottom line is a lot of this we try to offer to the kids, the parents, and, and the senior citizens and what is called curriculum enrichment. So Ron's here has been working on this for how long? A couple months. Okay, a couple months. New. Well, uh, off and on. Yeah. It's certainly yeah, I've done it off and on. I've done it off and on. Uh, as I, said, I started with this and then realized I was getting nowhere uh, very quickly. So uh, the bottom line is Ron, I met Ron and his wife and we took it out as a project. So, He's going to explain to you today then how the, uh, the Arduino the microcontroller works. The top part, uh, maybe sometime in the near future, what I've done there, put a camera on top of there with a Raspberry Pi. So that can project it or can go on the internet or you can take pictures with it or video with a Raspberry Pi up here and then all this is Arduino control. <coughs> control. Thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, why do this? It's probably a good question. Uh, as Ann was saying, the intention is to automate a traditional microscope. So this is a student-style biology microscope you'd see in high schools or colleges, things like that. And they've come down tremendously in price recently. So. This sort of scope, even with the binocular scope and everything else, is about $400, where if you looked at, you know, a while ago, there'd be thousands of dollars. So you have a way of inexpensively having the microscope, right? So that's cool. I mean, you can put a slide on and you can have students look at it, let's say in a high school classroom. Um, but what are your problems? You can only have one person looking at it at a time, right? And what happens when you put a little, you know, a drop of pond water on there and you're trying to follow one of those little critters that's in the water, little bugs? Well, by the time you found the bug, gone. So it's really hard for, for a, a teacher to kind of present that. Uh, so what, what they do, what they first did is they uh, set up these so that you could put a, a digital camera or a video camera up here. So you could videotape and you could project on a big screen uh, what you would see through the scope. Okay, that's a good first start, right? But what happens 
if you're a doctor and you're trying to teach somebody about how do I find a cancer cell? How do I find this? How do I find this on a slide? You know, you have a tiny little slide, but when you blow it up, when you're looking through it, there's a lot of things to look for, right? How do you teach somebody to find it? it it's difficult. Now, traditionally, what they would do is a pathologist would take the slide, he or she would find it, find whatever the key thing is, and they'd make a dot or circle around that area. So then the student could take the slide, find the bullseye, basically, and zoom in and see what it looks like. Well, again, that's fine if you have access to the pathologist and you have the slide right there and everything else. Uh, what happens if you're in the middle of nowhere? You don't have a pathologist. You could be in the Alaska tundra. You, there's a doctor there who could take a sample, but they don't might not have the expertise to know, you know, what kind of cell it is. All these different sorts of problems get solved when you start automating these tools. And as Dan mentioned, automated microscopes are available, but from a pricing standpoint, it's insane. I mean, they start. Just ones that automate this sled here are thousands of dollars, and it just goes up. So it's not something that could be put before the affordable for an underprivileged uh, area. It's certainly not affordable for both schools, you know, high school or grammar schools, or individuals for that matter. So this pathologist in Australia came up with an idea to retrofit a common microscope, which is, this is a relatively common model. What you see here is pretty standard. You've got, you know, this moves around, you look through the eyepieces. The one knob down here moves the slide this way, and then this other knob moves it this way. And then you have the focusing, which is done by, I got the tension on right now, done by the big knob on the side. So up and down the focus, right? And then that's your y-axis, and that's your x-axis. So pretty common setup. So but like he came up with this idea, and he's like, I want to modify the microscope to automate it, but I don't want to permanently damage the scope. So we, we want to be able to make it automated, computerized, or a remote controlled, or whatever, without damaging it. So he came up with this bracket. And this is a 3D printed piece that um, two motors hang off of. And mounted, it gets mounted there, and it's a big, it's, it just wasn't very strong. It's, it's not a very strong piece. Um, so when Dan asked uh, my wife and I to take a look at this problem, one of the first things we did was go to 3D model, 3D printing. And as Dan has talked about in previous um, events, you've got these 3D printed parts. So here, what, why 3D printed? I could have made it out of wood, I probably could have made it out of metal. Um, but 3D printers are becoming easier and easier to get at for, for communities. I mean, the Copper Cove Library has a 3D printer that anybody can go into and print on. Um, and that's true for a lot of libraries. So, and machinists are expensive and they're hard to come by. So, you know, if I had to have this piece machined out of metal, it would be time consuming and expensive. And I wouldn't be able to iterate through it. Because if you look at these parts, you can see like this gap here is bigger than this gap here. And then there, one of them is a little bit longer than the other. So, well, why did we do this? Because, oh, okay, great, it doesn't fit. <laughs> so we go into the computer and we modify the model. And I said, Evelyn, I need this to be about a quarter inch more gap in there. So she, you know, she goes and, and does that. I think this was actually V1. This was too loose. And then we had version two, 
which was too tight, and then version three, which was just right. right? So here's how 3D printing makes this very useful, is that changing these models, once you've built the main model, is pretty trivial. So you can pass these around to take a look at them. It's pretty, you know, you, you, it's like a picture. You have a grid and like, oh, it's set to half an inch, make it three quarters of an inch. So it allows you to very quickly prototype, uh, which is one of our key things with using 3D printing. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I want this to be interactive. No. I wondered if you could have made this where it was adjustable and it fit any type of stage or any. Right. Where this slides up and down, where it comes. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no, no. It's a, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Th th this is. Where's the black one? Yeah, here's the black one right here. Can make something to turn to make it fit. That's kind of what he did here with Holt. I see. Okay. So the same concept, but for a different reason. But anyway, you can make the holes and then change it accordingly. Oh, so you okay. can do anything change you hole. want. Right. You can make the hole better. And, and, and that, that's another plus with 3D printing, because we could go two directions with that, right? We could either design a more general one that's adjustable, uh, or mm -hmm. we provide the person the model and they could adjust it themselves, just like we did. So if they had a scope that our bracket was just a little too, too big or a little bit too small, they could resize it. We're, we're doing it on relatively tight tolerances right now because the more adjustable you make something, kind of the looser it gets. You know, it's, it's a little bit less flexible. And even with the 3D printed part, you can see there's a screw here that goes through the part, and that actually gets screwed up to hold in place like a clamp. So this could even be wider, and then that screw could clamp it. Because here's the challenge. This part, which I'll get to in a second what it actually does, it can't be attached to the base because the whole stage moves, right? So the motors have to move with the stage. The focusing is easy. I could put a motor here and have a belt, and this is fixed. It's just spinning. Right? So I could put a motor here and spin that. You can't do that here. This whole darn thing moves, so this has got to move with it. So that was, you know, how do you make it strong enough? How do you make it flexible enough? Uh, how do you make it fit into this space? Right? You have a space limitation. I can't, like, go down any further because I'll hit the base. I can't go any more this way because I'll hit the other parts of the stage. So. Now we have this mount. So we, we talked about 3D printing a little bit. We also 3D printed, how do I move these things, these dials? Right now it's by hand, right? Because you'd be sitting there looking through it, spin, spin, spin. Well, I need to move it. I'm going to move it with some motors, which I'll show you. And But I need to be able to transfer the power from the motors to the dials. How do you do that? Gears. Belts and gears. Again, here is a great use of 3D printing. I design these gears, and there's, a, there's software that automatically, I tell it what kind of belt it is. It's a GT2 belt, it's two millimeters, the teeth are this big. It automatically figures out all the teeth of the gear. So, I don't, again, I don't need to have machinist experience to do that. Uh, Gears and threads are one of the more difficult things when you're machining something. And so here you can kind of see, you can pass them around. One of the gears is smaller than the other. And its interior diameter is a different size from the other. And that's because, well, if you look at the scope, different sizes. One's bigger, Y is bigger, X is smaller. And again, so I had to size that interior diameter to these. 
So I took my dial calipers, I measured that distance, I printed it out, I found that my measurement was wrong, I changed it, I did it again, I printed it out again, but it allowed me to iterate through it and, and make mistakes cheaply. Like if I made those gears out of metal and I found they didn't fit, I'd probably be pretty unhappy. Because <laughs> I would have spent probably five hours making one gear and it's unhappy. Here, if I don't do it right, I'll try it again. So these just slip fit onto there. And you see, I was slightly cunning in my design in that both of these, their outer diameter, their inner diameter is different, but their outer diameter is identical. This means that they both have the same number of teeth, um, and they have the same out diameter. So I don't have to do any crazy calculations. I know that both of these have 60 teeth. I don't have to say, well, the X has 48, and the other one has 50. So look at that. There we go. Now we've got two gears on this thing, and we haven't messed up the microscope at all. Pop it right off. We haven't damaged it at all. Good to go. And again, if it was your own scope and you wanted to glue it in place, that's fine. But we're trying to build something that's, that's a little less intrusive. So, what is this great boondoggle here? Oh, Dan, you forgot your extension cord. I was going to bring mine too, but I forgot. So we're going, I forgot something else too that's key to this. But So here... These are two motors, and they've got two little gears on here that are the same, and these we bought. These you could buy off of Amazon 